Have you ever slammed your head against the wall or aggressively smashed your face against the machine because you've had a hard time holding a surface finish, getting proper chip control, or holding a critical tolerance? If that's the case, maybe this video will help. Hey team, this is Luke with Practical Machinist and we're back for another wonderful episode of The Lathe Lab. In this video, we're gonna go over three mistakes that I see people make on a setup that are easily fixable for nearly zero dollars. My type, my type of fix. Zero bucks, cheap and effective. The three that we're gonna cover are gonna be coolant, proper tool selection, and how to control or improve your understanding of speeds and feeds. So the first section we're gonna cover in this video is coolant. And a lot of people say, hey, as long as there's a little bit of coolant or oil dribbling on it, we'll be good. Sometimes that might be true, but for the most part, that is bad advice. The way coolant is uh, administered today in majority of machine shops is coolant concentrate. You buy a big barrel of coolant that's say a, a 1 to 50 or it's supposed to be mixed a 1 to 50 ratio or 1 to 10 ratio of coolant concentrate to water. If you want to make sure the first thing you do is to verify that your coolant ratio is mixed properly. The way that we do that is with a refractometer commonly referred to as a refractometer. What this handy little piece of equipment does, you take a little drop of coolant, drop it on there from your machine or what's being proportioned from your barrel, gently lay the glass down, and then you look through it as though you're an 1800s pirate sailing sea on the open seas. And on the inside, it's gonna have a little gauge. That gauge is gonna have a number, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. The proportion, the number that you wanna read, you need to get a hold of your coolant manufacturer to determine what's their recommended proportion. Once you know that, get a refractometer. Double check you have the right proportion. If you have too much versus you have too little, it can have negative effects on your machining directly relating to negative effects on your finished component. Also, if you're using too much, you can be spending more money than what you need to. It's a side note, but it's something important to bring up. Now, once we have the coolant uh, ratio mixed properly, the biggest part that might be more important than this is the coolant delivery method. How is the coolant be delivered to your part? If you have a turning tool and this turning tool is in your machine, and you're aiming your coolant down and it's hitting the top of the tool, it's gonna look from the machine as it's running like, oh, everything is wet and has coolant, but maybe it's not optimal. You wanna have the coolant directed at your cutting edge, if possible, and most of the time it is. If you're aiming it down here, that's not horrible. You're getting it. I like to aim right underneath. The idea is you wanna try to get the coolant between your insert and your workpiece. If you're drilling, you want to try to have through tool coolant. If you don't have through tool coolant or through spindle coolant, or I'm sorry, through your turret coolant, which is fine. A lot of, some of our machines don't have it at all. We have to use what's called flood. On your drill, you're going to have another line. It's not going to go through the drill. It's going to hit the drill at a pecking cycle. If you're doing deep hole drilling to get water inside there, help flush out the chips, help keep it cool. That being said, we're gonna take a look at some coolant delivery methods in my machine employed right now. You're gonna see exactly what I mean before we move on to the next topic. Here's one example of good coolant flow through the tool. You can see. Now in this tool here, hard to get back to see, it's a turning tool. The coolant nozzle is gonna blow the coolant under the, the cutting edge. Our cutting edge is here. Our coolant is directed right here. If you were to have a coolant nozzle here blowing towards the back of the tool, that might add some benefit, but it would be minimal. Here, we're going to flood the cutting edge with the coolant. That's what you want. And it's the same thing. Let's bring up another tool here. There's a perfect example. It's our turning tool. 
Here's our cutting edge. Our coolant line is gonna blow coolant right there. See if we can bring that up right away. Time to take a shower. See that? That's what you want. It's underneath the tool. It's a common mistake I see people make that they think, oh, long as it's wet, it's good. Sometimes that's true. Adding a little bit of coolant could help, but we want to flood that cutting edge. That's your coolant delivery. We got coolant through the drill, and I showed you when you have your turning insert where you want your coolant and where you don't. It's a free fix. The refractometer, I think you can get it for 50 bucks on eBay or something like that. So that's not exactly free, but it's not expensive. And the amount of money, time, and headache you can save by verifying that your coolant concentration is correct, that $50 is gonna pay for itself, undoubtedly. So now let's move on to the next section, proper tool selection. This is very simple, but certain things can be easily overlooked, especially by people first getting into our industry, our wonderful industry of machining. If you have a, a bore that you need to make in a part, you don't want to use a turning tool for that. You're going to want to use a drill, core out the hole. Then you're going to use an ID turning tool or a boring bar, finish the hole. That's pretty obvious. Well, let's extrapolate that out a little further now. If you have a part that you have OD grooves on that are 90 degree OD grooves, you're going to use a grooving tool. Many different styles to choose from. That's also quite obvious. What's not as obvious as this. Say you have a two inch bore in a part that you need to make. Two inch plus or minus five thou. You would not use a one inch drill and then use your finished bore to take all that off in one shot. You want to use the biggest drill possible for that print and what your machine can handle. Then if it's a lot of material more to remove, say 150 per side or more, 100 per side or more, you're going to want to rough that out. Rough bore it out, come in with the finish bore. That's an example of proper tool selection. Same with the OD. If you have a, a application where you're doing heavy outside roughing, you would not want to use a style like a V-style tool. It's just not as strong as it could be. Same thing, you would not want to use a groover to do heavy roughing on the OD. What you would want is a more robust geometry. Now, I like WNMG, as everyone probably knows. CNMG is a more robust tool. Now, let's take that one step further. In addition to just the tool itself, heavy rough with this, don't heavy rough with this. Once we have our selection for heavy roughing, now your nose radius. You would not want to use an 8,000th nose radius to rough turn. The bigger the nose radius, the more damage it can take. The bigger the nose radius, the heavier cut, the heavier feed rate it can take. That's just the way it is. I don't make the rules, I follow them. So if you're doing heavy roughing, use the biggest nose radius you can for your spindle load allowable and for what your print it needs. Now let's flip that idea on its head. Say you're doing a finish pass. You don't want to use a 433 or a 3 thou, or I'm sorry, an uh, 045 thou radius to do a finisher. You can for sure, without a doubt, but you're just gonna have to leave more material for it. I like to use a sharper tool, a little bit more positive and a smaller nose radius to do the finish pass. So keep that as a loose rule. Heavier depth of cut, bigger radius. Lighter depth of cut, more of a finishing pass, smaller radius. Same thing, these are improvements that you can make that cost zero bucks. Choosing the right tool for the right job. And if you go back to other um, videos in the Lathe Lab on a Practical Machinist channel, we dive in depth in this further. We go over drilling, we go over turning, um, a bunch of different videos on the Lathe Lab, but also with the rest of the awesome creators at Practical Machinist. Let's move on to the last subject now. Understanding speeds and feeds better to optimize your process. I myself have done this and I've seen many people do it as well, where I literally smash my face aggressively off the machine because the tool life is so horrible. My surface finish is garbage. I got a bird's nest in the machine that I can't even run. 
So what do I do? After I'm done smashing my face aggressively against the machine, I just take a step back and say, maybe my speeds and feeds are wrong. So what does that mean, speeds and feeds? Speeds, how fast are you running your spindle? What's your RPM or what's your SFM, surface footage per minute to be more specific? What's your feed? How fast are you feeding your tool? A proper understanding of speeds and feeds can take you from um, slamming your face against the machine to a shop hero that everyone looks to for help. It could take you from battling chips and battling tool life on a daily basis to having a smooth running job is a proper understanding of speeds and feeds. I'm gonna reference again, there's past videos all over the Practical Machinist channel, specifically mine, the lathe lab, that we go over speeds and feeds and chip control more in depth. Just to cover it a little bit here, for your roughing, you want to have a bigger nose radius. That's established in section two of the video. But now what do you do with that? Your speed, your SFM, is going to be dictated by the tooling that you're using, the material that you're cutting, and the machine you have. Go to your, material, your insert manufacturer to determine from them what's your SFM. Right there, full stop, because in this video we can't go over ferrous, non-ferrous, high nickel alloys, tool steel, hard turning, stuff like that. We, we can't cover that all in this video. SFM, surface footage per minute or RPM, contact your manufacturer. They'll steer you in the right direction. Once that's covered, the feed rate you guys can all handle, without a doubt. Everyone who watches this channel or watches this video is an awesome, highly intelligent individual. Your feed rate is dependent upon your nose radius and your surface finish requirement on the print. Say we're doing a finisher with the CNMG 431 to, to cater to the CNMG fans out there. So one nose radius, one sixty-fourth, one divided by sixty-fourth equals fifteen. The nose radius is fifteen. I think 0 .0156. 0 .0156. So let's just say fifteen thousandths. You want to feed one-third minimum and two-thirds maximum the feed rate. You want to make sure that your depth of cut is the size of the radius, if allowable. So we want to make sure we have 15 per side for that 431 to have proper chip control. That feed rate, you want to feed at 5 thou minimum, 10 thou maximum. You're going to take that information, and my favorite word of this month is extrapolate. You're going to extrapolate that out to the rest of your tooling. If you have a VNMG 332, a two nose radius, two sixty-fourths is what that means. Two divided by sixty-fourth is about thirty or thirty-one thousandths. Follow the two-thirds, two, the one-third, two-thirds rule. That will be a great start for you to master speeds and feeds. But we're not done yet. It's a starting point. So let's go back to the 431, 164, 15 thou. One third nose radius minimum is five. Two thirds nose radius maximum is 10. That is a loose rule. You might find when you feed it at 11, you get a wonderful surface finish and your chip is flying off. Keep it at 11. You might find out that when you feed at five, you're getting great chip control, but your RA or your surface finish is a little high in your profilometer. Kick it down to four. But make a note, a mental note or a paper note. For example, 1215, one inch round, I was turning, I used this geometry, this brand of tool, at this surface footage and this feed rate to achieve my goal. The next time it comes up in a month, a year, two years, or when you're training someone, you're going to have that information. That's the key. Mastering speeds and feeds is to go to find the information you need. Get a hold of the manufacturer. Talk to someone in your shop that you trust. Try things. Don't go crazy on your feet and speed and blow up tools. Follow the one-third, two-third minimum rule for your feed. For your speed, contact the manufacturer. Take notes. They'll have a sheet from the main tooling manufacturers on what they recommend for surface footage for different alloys, ferrous, non-ferrous, high nickel, tool steel, hard, soft state, 
Get that sheet, keep it in your box, take a screenshot of it on your phone. You got this. So that covers today's video. We went over three problems that I see in shops often and a very simple free, aside from the refractometer, a free way to fix it. We went over coolant, coolant delivery and what it is. We went over the proper tool for the proper job and we went over the beginning of you mastering speeds and fees on a CNC lathe. These three tips can take you from a frustrating, horrible day in a shop to that next day, making it a little bit better. And then that next day or that next week, a little bit better. And slowly you learn and learn and learn and boost yourself up. Master speeds and feeds. Master your proper tool selection. Do a little bit of mental, a little bit of mental fortitude work and fight through the problem and get it. Figure out the delivery method. Don't get lazy. Take time, change out that nozzle to something that's gonna point it right at the tool. Adjust your speeds and feeds and get the proper tool and watch your day or your week of frustration completely turn upside down. Then when you get there, come back, like this video, comment and say, Luke, you're the best that I've ever heard. I'm just kidding about that part, but for real, we do this to help you guys out there. Thank you for watching. This is Luke with Practical Machinist. Leave a like, follow, comment, share. Check out all the other videos on Practical Machinist. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.